Because we find we get to the end of the talk, oh, wow, that was a great talk. And then we get home and we can't remember what we're still great about it. So make notes. If you think of something, oh, I really should, you know, write it down. Make you know, even one word. That will help you remember. Um, and are you controlling this? <laughs> okay. Talking about water today, I want you to imagine a river and you're on a boat with your family. What happens if you're just relaxing on your boat and you're sitting in a river? Any of you get on rivers? What happens to a boat in a river? Where does it go? The current. The current, yes. It goes wherever the river is going, right? Yeah. So you follow it. And if it's a fast river, you go fast. And if it's a slow river, you go slow. And that's just how it goes. If it's a slow river like this one, would you even notice very much that you're moving? Or are you just hanging out? Yeah. You don't notice. don't notice. And if you're not paying attention, what might happen to your boat? You might ground it. <laughs> yeah, you might land somewhere you didn't intend to land. Right? <laughs> Depends on where it goes. You can end up in eddies and sandbars and all kinds of things. So what happens if you want to go a certain direction? What do you need to do to your boat? You need to paddle. You got to paddle, or what else? Motor or something, right? If you just sit there, you will go wherever the water takes you. If you want to go somewhere the water's not going, you got to work at it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, our society and our legal system are like a river. They will carry us where they take us. Um, and we have watched, unfortunately, a lot of families that are going along okay, and they're not really paying attention. And then the society, the legal system, the you know, powers that be around us in the world, carry them to a sandbar, or they hit ground, or something happens, their boat capsizes, and then they wonder, what happened to our family? Why is our family falling apart? It's because they were just floating. So we're going to talk today about what the current might do to us, but we're also going to talk about how to turn on that motor and go a different direction and keep our boats safe and healthy for us. Um, so we will talk about the sturdy boat that is God's plan for the family. And that's it. So. All right, so uh, if, you have your, if you have your sheet, so I'm going to be referring you down to your sheet. If you look, there is a statement there at the top that begins and says, the family is an institution. Everybody find that? Mm -hmm. yes. We're, yes. we're going to read that together. So let's, let's try that out. And, I'll, and let's try it. Oh, so the family is an institution is under attack from many fronts. We need to prevent the breaking up of families to make our marriages more resilient. For this we need to put on God's mind and to follow his plan for our family. All right, so God's plan for the family. So Suzanne brought up the image of a boat, so let's talk about a sturdy houseboat. What happens in a house? Well, a house is a place where families come together to work together, to uh, nourish themselves, to relax, to love each other. So this is what God wants for us. This is God's plan for us. Now, throughout the talk today, we're going to um, use and draw on the wisdom of the Bible. So we'll be focusing on both the Old Testament and the New Testament, specifically Genesis and Ephesians. We'll look at some passages. We'll study those together. And then also we're going to rely on the magisterium or the teaching authority of the church. We're going to take care of tradition or lean on that. We'll hear from the Second Vatican Council, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and also from Blessed Pope Paul VI. So let's start with Genesis. These verses that we're going to study are key verses that both Jesus and St. Paul referred to in the Bible when they talked about marriage. So I'm going to read this to you and, and um, you follow along on the, on the overhead slide. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother, and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now let's read this, this next part of Genesis all together. So we can read, it's going to be right up here, let's read it together. So God created man in his own image. 
in the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. All right, following our outline, God has intended the family for the transmission of life. God created people, male and female, with their physiology so formed as to enable people to increase and multiply and fill the earth. God intended man and woman to be one, not independent individuals producing babies, but a husband and wife raising a family. So this is one aspect of God's plan for the family. The second aspect cool. <laughs> is uh, the family is a place for teaching children and training leaders. It is, that is a cool picture, by the way. All right, so thinking about our house as a place that we instruct our children, let's, let's look at uh, what the Second Vatican Council had to say. Parents must be acknowledged as the first and foremost educators of their children. Their role as educators is so decisive that scarcely anything can compensate for their failure in it. So I would say, I think you all know this, we send our children to school, but frankly, they're educated long before preschool, kindergarten, because we're doing it in our homes, and they're watching us all the time. And we know that, we know that intuitively. Let's see what um, the Catechism has to say. So together, um, if you'll be patient, let's read this together. Parents have the first responsibility for the education of their children. They bear witness to this responsibility first by creating a home where tenderness, forgiveness, respect, fidelity, and disinterested service are the rule. Wow. Isn't that challenging? I look at that and think, hmm, can I do that? Well, yeah, we can do that. Um, Sometimes we'll fail, but this is, this is our goal. This is what we are looking to do, to have a home where we are tender, we forgive each other, we respect each other, that there is fidelity, you know, the faithfulness, and that disinterested service, where we do things for other people without expecting them to do them back to us. This is, this is not just about knowledge, it's about character. And so our children, we can teach them things, but we'll also show them things. What was that last one, Paul? Say it. Uh, On the last slide. Catechism 2223. Thank you. Sure, you're The family is a place to transmit wisdom and values of life. Teaching is not formal, but rather comes in the everyday activities in the home. A leader, and especially a church leader, receives basic training in their own home. The family is also a domestic church. We want that house boat to have a spiritual component too. So parents, especially the fathers, are to be the priests of their families. They present God to their families and by their example of living Christianity, we present our families to God. So how do we do that as families? We talk about the faith, we set a good example, we take the kids to church, Instead of saying, oh, I don't want to go to church today, you know, we show up with them. We pray with them. We read their Bible stories or religious books. Maybe our homes will have a little altar or uh, candles that, that express our devotion to our faith and to the saints. All of these things we do for our kids. And probably most importantly is we pray for them. We pray for them by ourselves. And we also pray for them as they go off to school. And you know, we bless our children. Blessed Pope, John, Blessed Pope Paul VI had this to say, Parents not only communicate the gospel to their children, but from their children they can, they can themselves receive the same gospel as deeply lived by them. As such, a family becomes the evangelizer of many other families and of the neighborhood of which it forms part. And now we're going to talk about why God's plan for families is not happening because just like us, you know many families that are really struggling. And so we want to talk about the current and what it does to us and how it sometimes runs us in the places we don't want to be. 
First, God has lost his central place in the family. Parents no longer bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. God is often not part of parenting. Husbands and wives do not follow God's order for them. Their commitment is shaky. They cannot be depended on, and their partners become insecure. So God is not part of marriage often. And there's also too much importance given to acquiring material possessions and having an easy and comfortable life. And I find this one most challenging, that we have a hard time accepting difficulties. Life is supposed to be happy and fun all the time now. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Real love is hard work. Um, and we tend to want to escape rather than to do the hard work necessary to fix the boat when there's problems. Um, or to get out and row when we need to go somewhere else. It's hard. Um, also, the family itself is losing its importance. Society says you don't need a boat anymore. Um, Many, family, many of the family's responsibilities have been taken over by other institutions, such as education and schools, or most of us work outside the home and we're gone a lot of the day working. In the past, um, as many of you know, probably most places in the world, people had family farms, and everybody worked and played and lived together, and they were always together in the boat all day long. And then even after the Industrial Revolution and, and uh, in the United States, people used to go home for lunch. Even, you know, they had breakfast at home, they came home from school, came home from work, had lunch together, and then they came home again in the evening and had dinner together. Um, nowadays, many families are apart for about 10 hours a day. The kids get dropped off at 8 in the morning and get picked up at 6 o'clock at night from school, and then the parents are at work all that time. That's a big challenge for us because we're not in the boat together for an awful lot of the day. So we have to work a lot harder at keeping our family strong. Also, even when we are home, we have modern recreation and communication that tend to cause diminished interaction between people. We're all watching the TV or everybody's on their video games or their smartphones and then we're not actually talking to each other even when we are there. Um, my kid's grandpa talks about he remembers when his family got a television because before the television, they were on a farm and he liked fixing the tractors and they had horses and cows and they were busy working the farm. And then when they had free time, they played cards and Monopoly, and they had basketball set up in their barn because it was snowy where they were, and all winter they would play basketball, and then they got a television. And he remembers the disappointment as everybody was watching the TV and no more cards, no more basketball, and all that. Um, but we know now it's not the television, it's the little handheld individual televisions. We're not even watching TV together anymore. So again, these are challenges to make sure that when we're in the boat together, we're actually together. Another thing that's going on in society is that the traditional family has become dispensable. It's a lot of work to build a houseboat. It's a lot easier to have two little individual boats and, well, we don't really need to get married and build a houseboat. We'll just kind of, you know, tie some ropes and tie our little kayaks together for a while and hang out until we don't like each other anymore and then we'll cut the ropes and go our separate ways. And a lot of people do that. And then, of course, when they add the kids to that, where do the kids go? Nowhere. All right? But that's very common, as you know, and separations and divorce are very easy to get legally in our country. Living together is very common, and even just having children without ever bothering to get married is very, very common in our society now. Um, which makes it hard for those of us who want to build a good, sturdy houseboat if we're surrounded by all these people who are enjoying the freedom of their own little boats that can do whatever they want. Um, it's not so encouraging to families anymore that are trying to build their houseboats. We don't have the models and encouragement we used to. Well, then there's this. Does it, doesn't life ever feel like this? <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Like, yeah, I'm hoping there's a seatbelt because um, it just, it, it always surprised me. People say, you know, how you doing? And the response is not, I'm fine, it's, I'm busy. So that's like a reflection of where we are in our, in our world. And members of our families are always on the go. They're, they're too busy to have meaningful interactions. Suzanne just mentioned meal times together so often suffer. People are going different directions. Their schedules are so busy. You have to fight that current. Um, and I'll just put a plug as a pediatrician. Eat at least one meal a day with your family as a family. It's so important. They need to know you're there. Things will come out. Conversations will happen that otherwise just don't. So another thing that's real can be quite difficult is the amount of time that um, the work takes on us as, as family members. You know, we're now in a position where 
um, in order to get by individual families or the breadwinners having to work longer and longer hours or, or both family members, both parents are working. And yet sometimes I often wonder um, what are we working for? And I'm not saying any of us here, but I've, I've encountered families that are working extra jobs to pay people to take care of their children so that they can go on vacations or have expensive homes. And it really, it's sad. I mean, it's, it's just quite sad. So what do we do? Um, I mean, personally, we've had to evaluate continuously, and, and one of the blessings of those six children is every time we had another kid, we had to say, like, okay, what's going on in our lives? We had to cut things out to make our lives more focused on the family. And um, that's actually been a challenge now that Andrew is six and there's no extra little brother or sister. It's been we've had to be especially focused because when there's not a child there to reset you, um, you have to be especially vigilant. Sometimes the decision is we have to cut out our hobbies, or sometimes the decision is we just shouldn't work that extra shift because it's just not worth it. For some people, it's quite radical. They change jobs because their job has become negative for their family. So, you know, you all will be able to answer that in your own lives, but just you want to be careful because things will creep in without you even knowing. It's back to the example that Suzanne gave. We're just going to we start flowing. Um, Sometimes it can even be good things. We keep saying yes to another ministry or yes to another act of service, and then our kids don't see us. And I often worry as a father that I haven't done any good to my, my domestic church, my, my home church, my house, if I'm taking care of everybody else and I'm not taking care of my kids. So the family is also under attack by evil forces. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. And it's, it's, it's a fact. The devil wants to break up the family and promotes many things to undermine it, <coughs> such as secularism, which means taking God out of the educational system and out of government, materialism, which means putting all the emphasis on things instead of people, and relativism which means there's no real right or wrong. It all just sort of depends where you are. And that's not the kind of current we want to be in. That's not where we want our boats to take us or our children. Also, anti-life forces have become very aggressive. The culture of death creeps into many societies through the promotion of abortion and contraception. Again, this is places we don't want our children to go. So we need to be careful that we don't go there and accidentally lead them. Suzanne and I personally, we've taught classes to couples for the last 20 years as volunteers explaining the church's teaching on family planning. And if any of you would like to know more about that, we'd be happy to talk to you. It's, uh, it's been a, a joy and a struggle at times in our own, our own life. But honestly, we all know this, what thing of value doesn't require some struggle? So what can we do? Well. We can make a decision that in your family, you want God's plan to happen. And how do you do that? Basically, you make a strong boat, a strong houseboat that has, you know, promotes life, that educates your children, that um, promotes spirituality. And you do that not just for your own home, but for your neighbors on either side of you. You take care of them. And not just the people on your street, but your nieces and nephews who live across town or even in another town. Your co-workers, we all point people in the same direction. We all point them towards God. Where that stream is coming from in the first place, where all that water is coming from is God. So we want to point upstream and aim people there and take them there, not just our own family, but others as well. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> making time for the task of building a strong family. Okay, this is the opposite of the frantic, busy current, is we can choose to slow things down. Examine your daily life to ensure that your family has enough quality time together. Be ready to reduce your other activities if necessary. Um, one thing David mentioned, I asked him, what should we say in the talk? He said, oh, our family vacation. We go camping every summer with the grandparents, the aunts, and the uncles, and we do an extended family time together. And camping is nice because you're just kind of sitting there, and there's not a lot to do, so you actually see each other. And there's no TV, no, you know, no gadgets. Um, it's nice. Elizabeth mentioned, we have to eat meals together. And that's important in our house. We eat together a lot. Um, but these things are the first step. The first step is making sure that you're actually in the boat together. 
Because if you're not in the boat together, then you can't do anything else. Um, but then I also want to talk about what can we do to help other people. I mean, the first step is we've got to make sure our boat is strong, but lots of other people around us need our help too. And so I will start with the examples we have in the room. Felipe and Rube have helped with Vacation Bible School, which is ministering to lots of kids from lots of families. Guillermo has painted both the school and the church before. Veronica used to come over and help me when my kids were really little. She helped pick up all the mess that was everywhere. And she was very cheerful about it, which was good because I wasn't. <laughs> Martha used to sit next to us in the bilingual mess many years ago. We enjoyed watching her with her kids and saying hi because we were always right near each other. It was good. And Glynis and Mo, when uh, Elizabeth was born 12 years ago, it was right before David's birthday. David was turning eight, and we had all these little eight-year-old boys coming over. And so we asked Glynis and Mo, can you please come, and when you bring Gabe, can you stay and help run the birthday party? Because I was, you know, like this with a newborn, and so it was too much for Paul. So they came and they helped, and that was really awesome. And I know Mary Pat has taught confirmation, reaching out to all the young people in our parish. And I remember meeting Tony the first time when his son was little and my son was little, and we were standing in the back of the church because there wasn't a cry room at that point. And so we just stood in the back hanging out with our kids, but he was doing that so Mary Pat could pay attention in Mass, okay, which is a gift of service in the family. All right, and I know Julia has taught CCD and confirmation. Seth helps us with our son John in Boy Scouts. All right, who am I missing? I'm just going around the room. Rowana takes care of foster kids all the time, which is totally awesome. Sister Jane is hiding back there. She brings really yummy food for my kids to eat at all our products. <laughs> And Susan B. has been taking care of children for years in our school system, which is totally awesome. And she's helped with Vacation Bible School in the parish as well. So all of you candidates already know what this is about. You're already doing it. Um, and what I do want to say is keep thinking, brainstorm, because there is so much need out there. There are families where both parents are working, and they're really on that frantic boat. You could help with the driving of the kids to the baseball or the you know, ballet lessons, or whatever. You can help by bringing meals. I mean, there's some families that I don't think eat because there's nobody home to cook, right? Um, so different things like that. Also, if your children are growing up, be sure to share these ideas with them as they're preparing to get married. Um, I know some of us have kids in that age range where they're starting to get to be teenagers, or they're in college, and they're getting close to starting their own families. Um, and I know Susan has spent a lot of time with her grandkids. Same thing, parenting the next generation. Um, so all of these are ways we can reach out. Oh, and I was going to mention, I forgot, the people who are not here, Diane comes to our house every week and brings sweets for my kids and they love her to death. Yeah. And that started years ago. She used to bring library books and read them stories when they were little. Um, and Annie, when I was on bed rest, when I was pregnant with Andrew, she came home from fixing my kids' lunch because they were like fending for themselves while I was stuck on the couch. And Mariana was always available when we need professional help from him. And we have called on him many times. Um, and I can't read from there. Oh, and Roger sings in the choir. Roger's not here today, but Roger sings in the choir, which is a ministry to all the families um, who are listening, because we always need more men in our choir. So I'm thankful for him. And um, Brother Corbett is an encouragement to Paul. They see each other all the time at Daily Mass. So all you candidates know what's going on, but I do want to throw in a word also about balance. And we've kind of already talked about this. It's really important that we you know, be that fire hose putting out the fires on everybody else's boats. We need to do that. But at the same time, if while we're doing that, our own boat is falling apart and our kids are drowning, that's no good. So, um, and even as the kids grow up and you know, we're getting that way soon, you still have to work on the marriage. And if you're a single person, you have to work on taking care of yourself. Even as a single person, you need time to pray. You need time to read the Bible. You need time with friends. It can't be all service. On the other hand, if you're one of those people who takes really good care of yourself and you really like to kind of be in your boat with your family and you just hang out, you have to get out and administer to other people too. So we all need that balance um, of making sure both our own boat and other people's boats are strong. Ideally, it's really nice when you can do it together and you're building your own boat while you're building somebody else's boat. Okay, and Couples for Christ is a good example for that where we try and build each other's families and build our own families kind of all at the same time. And I know one night we just had Eric and Agnes just come over for dinner and hang out and play cards. And that was fun. That built our family. It built their family. You know? um, so there are ways you can do both at the same time. But this is something we struggle with all the time. We're constantly, not arguing exactly, but sometimes, about whether we're doing too much or too little or, you know, because it, it spins out of control. We both 
are kind of volunteer holics, and, and it gets spins out of control very fast. And so we have to keep pulling it back in, and then we've got to get volunteering again, and then we got to, you know. So there's that balance. Um, but enough of that. You can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to pray together as a family. So uh, we attend Holy Mass together. Pray the rosary as a family, and, and make yourself available to activities and events at the church. We didn't start praying the rosary as a family together until the um, the pilgrim statue of Our Lady of Fatima came through about it's been almost two years now. But that was a real that that was something that was new for us. So be open to blessings from the church. Uh, this year, Divine Mercy, the first time I've really like okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take these baby steps and lead our families. And we did some of it, not all, and I'm I'm hoping next year to do more. I, um, the Simbangami this last year, the 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 masses, special masses before um, Christmas that the Filipino community does. I know that that uh, was really special for Tony and Mary Pat and was for me, and next year I'm going to try and bring the family. So, you know, these are things that we do as a, as a family. Uh, fathers should assume, oh, thank you. and that's again, these are things that we as fathers can do. You know, it's, but I'm supposed to say thank you. Yeah, for yes. Okay. Oh, yes, that's right. And you were, that's right. That's, and that's another way to welcome. Thank you. That's, that's anybody so you were all there long more than I was. So, <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, we're, um, this is our New Testament Bible study, which is going to be Ephesians. It talks about the family. So what I'd like to do is, it's real long, but we are going to read it. I'd like you to read the parts in bold, and then I'll read the parts that are not in bold, and we'll see if we can push through this, because it's important. So, um, again, let's start together. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. <laughs> this will just be me, and then we go back. So, the, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject to everything to their husbands. Together. Husbands, husbands love to your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And here's Genesis. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is a profound one, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. And lastly, all together. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right, well, oftentimes we'll hear this at, uh, at weddings and so on, but what does it mean? In some families, you know, it, it can somewhat be jarring, especially, um, you know, especially, well, I'll have Suzanne talk a little bit more about it, but let me, let me say something that's in your, your handout there. It says, fathers should take steps to assume full responsibility for the sp spiritual and material needs of the family. And what I want you to underline there is, take steps, okay? All of us have different families. We have spouses we respect. I think every man in here who's married respects their wife greatly. And I know personally, you know, in my family, Suzanne is very knowledgeable in the Bible. She's read it at least two times, and I'm only working on reading it through the first time myself. But part of that was my making, taking steps to say, like, okay, I want to help lead. I, I want to be part of the family, the spiritual things. Uh, Suzanne, as um, Michelle mentioned, she reads the, the gospel reading and the daily readings to the kids every day. 
Well, last year and a half ago, I started going to daily mass, and now I have stuff to, to contribute in those discussions because I heard, I heard a homily and I've been thinking about it myself. So I think the, the idea here is that both spouses represent Jesus to each other. But in the sacrament of marriage, the husband represents Jesus and the wife represents the bride. So the husband takes on a bit more of Christ's role of meeting spiritual and material needs of the family. This is the same Bible verse. I just so I about wives to support the mission of the husband, because as you probably all know, it's very easy in our society. Um, girls are raised to be equal with boys, and it can be very easy for the husbands and the men in our society to kind of get stepped on. <laughs> and women tend to be pretty strong, especially some of us. Um, but we want to support the husband in his mission. Okay, let him lead. Um, let him be like Jesus for our families. So, um, in terms of this cool thing here, spiritual needs, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Okay, this is all spiritual needs, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So what does Jesus do? He protects us from Satan and cleanses us from sin. So fathers and mothers too should protect the family from bad influences. We need to monitor the internet. We need to ask our kids how their day at school was and what's going on. And we need to get to know their friends. Okay, and maybe husbands and wives even need to help each other. You know as spouses what the other person's weaknesses are. You need to help each other grow spiritually. But the Father's job in being like Jesus is to keep the family clean. That's one of our spiritual needs. Jesus also sanctifies us and makes us holy. So the Father's job is also, like Paul was talking about, praying, reading the Bible, making sure everyone in the family gets to Mass and confession, okay, things like that. But leadership inspires and encourages the family um, to go in a certain direction. So the Father might share a concern. I see our boat is heading towards a bad spot. We need to kind of redirect, okay? We might call the family together to pray, or might invite the family to do service for a neighbor. Hey, let's go lead at the church, or let's go help this neighbor who's moving. Um, taking steps towards assuming responsibility does not mean the husband does it all, okay? It means he makes sure it gets done and participates as much as he can. Some dads are gone an awful lot of the time doing other things. Um, but they can still be helping. For example, if it fits the schedule better for the wife to drive the kids to CCD, that's not a problem. The husband can make sure that she's able to do that, and the husband can ask the kids questions about what they learn later on when he is home. Okay, but he's still participating in that and making sure that it happens. Um, like we mentioned, at our house, I'm home more consistently at breakfast, so I, I like to read the kids the daily readings. We don't make it to mass because I'm not quite there yet, but. We do read the readings and we talk about them. And my kids are getting kind of sick of that. But that's what we do. Um, and at night, Paul is reading. They started in the Old Testament. And they're in, like, I don't know, Exodus or somewhere. Or poor kids. All right, so, but we're making sure they learn their Bible, all right? Um, but again, it's, a, it's about working together. So here's another example. Let's say at dinner, the father decides to take some steps towards spiritual leadership and says, hey, kids, after dinner, let's... Do the dishes, and let's pray a rosary. And what do the kids say? Uh, do we have to? Right? That's all your kids. My kids, right? Okay. So, now the wife has two options. What does the wife want to say? Do we have to? Right? Well, what should the wife say if she's going to submit it? She's going to support his mission, and he's trying to take some spiritual leadership here. All right? Great idea, dear. Kids, let's do the dishes. We're going to pray a rosary because our neighbor just fell and broke her hip, and we need to pray for her. Okay? That's the way we as wives can be submissive. We can support the husband trying to take spiritual leadership. And obviously we want to teach our children to do the same, whether it's father or mother who's taking spiritual leadership, or grandparents or uncles or whatever. We want to be responding positively when somebody's trying to get our boat going in a good direction. Okay? And help row. Okay. Um, now let's talk about meeting material and physical needs. Let me see. Boop, right here. Okay. So this is later on in the verse. It says, For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. 
So nourishing and cherishing. Um, and I want to point out that this is not just about being the breadwinner. It's not saying, okay, every husband has to make the most money in the family. Most of our families and couples for Christ have had the wife earning more money than the husband at some point or another, if not all the time, but at least some of the time. Um, especially in this economy, whoever can get a job, get a job, right? Okay, but meeting the material needs of the family is not just making the money, okay? The money has to be spent shopping, buying the stuff we need. Um, there's also building things and repairs. There's laundry, gardening, driving, keeping track of the finances, cooking. Okay, all of that is part of meeting the needs of the family. And for most of us, it's a big job and it takes two people to get it done. Okay? Um, so we work together. And the spouse who's working less hours outside the home might need to be supportive of the spouse who's working more time um, and pray for them and help them get to work on time. Take care of things at home so they can rest when they get back. That's all part of meeting the spiritual, or the, sorry, the material needs of the family. Um, so the husband taking responsibility means being a team leader and making sure that the team works together to make sure that the boat is in good shape, all right? That there's food on the boat and the clothes are clean and the boat is strong and sturdy and people get taken to their school or their activities where they need to go. All of that's meeting those needs. Um, so go ahead and divide up the work according to abilities and make sure that the children get included. So how do we work this out? Perhaps the husband says, you know, I don't think we can afford whatever. I've been looking at the finances, okay? The husband is not like a boss, you know. This is not about bossing because they're supposed to be like Jesus, right? Husbands, lay down your lives for your wife. So it's the suggestion of, I don't think we can afford this. I've been looking at the finances, okay? Not, you can't ever buy any more clothes for the whole rest of the year because it's too expensive, all right? That's the bossing around. That's not what we're talking about, okay? But when the husband suggests it, how does the wife be submissive? I mean, she could argue and say, well, I can afford whatever I want, please. All right, that's not being submissive. Being submissive is saying, show me the numbers. Let's talk about what's going on with our finances, and maybe we can work out a way we can afford this, but we need to work on it as a team together. Okay? And... <laughs> so, uh, we need to learn more about God's plan for the family. How do we do that? We attend teachings on Christian marriage and family life. Well, some of that's what we're doing right now. We read books, the Bible, um, but other Christian books and magazines. In our family, we've went and limited it down to maybe two magazines, good Christian Catholic magazines that we get, and those help encourage us. But also there's other music, there's other uh, sources. Our son has shown us lots of YouTube videos that have been, you know, in, encouraged us in our faith, and we've been able to... Uh, We've been able to educate the family that way about God's plan. Seek others who share your concern about family life and be in regular fellowship with them. If you become part of Couples for Christ, it's going to be like this every other weekend. <laughs> sort of. Well, maybe, yes. I mean, you know, yeah, it's actually it's a lot of fun. It does be a little smaller. Maybe this is the evangelization rally. But, um, <laughs> but it's fun. You know, look, look for other people to... to it, is share and support your family with, because that's how we're able to, you know, to not get taken where the current wants us, to not, not end up where society is leaving, leading us, but develop real relationships, friendships that are deeper than just, just being at mass and saying, hey, how are you? But we actually care about each other and want to know how others are doing. All right, so on, on the bottom of our, sh of our sheet there, we have uh, a little, another little statement, and let's read, let's read that together. It starts with God as a plan, so together. God, God has a plan, plan for our families, but the evil one wants to prevent this plan from happening. We should see the protection and the guidance of the whole family of Nazareth to make sure that happen. Sorry. All right, so um, how do we do that? I, there's just a mention of the Holy Family of Nazareth. We know about Jesus. We know about Mary. Uh, I've been to some confessions where the priest said, don't forget about Joseph. Joseph is a great Papa Joseph. Remember to include him and ask for his intercession as well. So the Holy Family really can be a model to us. So in conclusion, all families will drift to bad places if not actively trying to correct course, repair the boat, etc. We have to regularly assess the condition of the boat and the direction it's headed for our own families, but also for those around us. When there are problems, do something. Our family is not perfect, 
any of our neighbors, if you ask them how we talk to each other, when we're not standing up here presenting to you, they'll be able to tell you. <laughs> they'll tell you how imperfect we are. But the point is, we're trying and we're intentional. You know, Suzanne and I will, will take a walk around the block as a way of connecting together. We'll try a, a different way of praying, whether it's using a different spiritual discipline. We'll take the kids out to a fun activity. We'll choose not to do something so that we can stay at home with them. So we're both trying to keep track of how we're doing. And when we sense that we are drifting off the wrong way, we say something to each other and then we adjust course. So before we wrap it up, Suzanne is going to give you some, you know, discuss just briefly the scriptures yeah, that are at the very bottom. So very brief. Very brief. So I do want to say that the key thing is the little adjustments. It's far easier to keep a boat going the right direction if you do it a little bit at a time. If you wait till the boat is like totally hung up on a sandbar, tipping over, crashing, it's really hard to get it going again. Okay? So that's our encouragement. Just keep working at it, and it will be a lot easier. So the scriptures on the bottom of your page... Um, the first one is from Genesis. That's what we read, and you're free to read it again. Um, but we would hope that you know, look at some of these this week. The second one, Timothy, is about managing your household. Um, Deuteronomy is a beautiful passage where Moses encourages the people of Israel to talk about God's laws all the time and everything they're doing. It's a really nice one on parenting. The Ephesians is the one we read, and you, you know, again, can read it again. It's a good one. Uh, 1 Peter 5 is the devil prowling around like a lion that we read. 1 Peter 3 is um, similar to the Ephesians one about husbands and wives. Um, it's a little more aimed at women who don't have a believing husband. So if you're in that situation or you know somebody, it's a little more aimed that way. The last one, Sirach, is really beautiful. It's long, but it's very poetic about honoring father and mother. And it's a really beautiful thing, especially honoring aging parents. If that's something you need encouragement, um, the Sirach is really nice for that. And then I think we're going to take a stretch and find our discussion groups and cool off, hopefully. Cool off the, the, the only problem with this room is it gets really hot in the afternoon. So, so get some water, too, if you Thank need you to. very much for listening to us.